Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, this is something that we do every year. Um, first, who are we? We're the uh, ASIFA Hollywood's Animation Educators Forum. Um, we are just basically a group of educators that meet once uh, every month or every other month and discuss all things animation education. Um, uh, every year at CTN, we run an event at SIGGRAPH, and then we have a general membership where it's open to anyone um, locally, and we have an event there as well, and that's usually in February or March. Um, I am a, a, a co-chair of, of the Animation Educators Forum, along with Tom Cito, who could not be here today. Uh, he's in New York, uh, promoting his book. Um, but today, uh, um, Adriana, your last name, I always have a tough time with. That um, <laughs> uh, is my, my co-chair on this uh, panel, um, and we call it a panel, but it's more of an open discussion. You know, very often us educators don't get a chance to uh, to get together and talk, so uh, uh, CTN gives us this great room to do that. Um, we structured this a little bit differently, uh, where I we invite some guests. Um, we uh, have different perspectives from our guests, and, and we do that purposefully. So. Uh, if you've read the topic, uh, the conversation uh, will today will be about um, uh, students' abilities, uh, uh, t how we teach, and uh, whether or not we're teaching for the first job, are we preparing students for uh, the industry right away, or are we thinking more like lifelong learning and teaching students um, how to um, think and create and have skills that will last them a lifetime. And with so many different things to talk about and to teach in animation, um, what are the essential things, and, and how do we uh, fold that into four or five years of education? So um, with us today um, is uh, Dave Master over here. Um, Dave was um, Director of Artistic Development at Warner Brothers. He um, founded the Acme Virtual Training Network. Um, uh, he's done so many things for education, um, and I thought he'd be a great person. He, he ran a program at Roland high school uh, that students were graduating into uh, Disney and Warner Brothers, um, so I thought he'd be a great person to have. Uh, Brooke Kiesling, um, Manager of Animation Talent Development at Cartoon Network, and adjunct professor at CalArts, um, and um, Brooke has obviously experience on the uh, uh, education side as well as the uh, uh, industry side with talent development. And Sheila, Sheila Sofian. Um, associate Professor at School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California, and a, a narrative uh, filmmaker that focuses on uh, documentary animation and some experimental sides of animation. So I think this should start us off with a, a, a great beginning of a conversation. Oh, let me introduce the other uh, AEF members. Um, we have Dory Latell herrick uh, Mark Farquhar, Patrick Desprez, Kathy Bauer, Ron Brown's in the back. Who am I missing? Chuck. 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 There's Chuck. There's Chuck. Say hi, Chuck. Say hi, Chuck. All right. Well, let's make some room. There's seats over here, too, guys. Smush on in. There we go. Now it's going to be a conversation. Everybody gets three seconds. I mean, the rules. Choose your word carefully. You say fun. Um, Welcome. Um, so why don't we begin um, just hearing from our, our guests, uh, maybe some opening statements about their thoughts on the topic, and then we'll um, open it up to the, uh, the whole room and uh, see how people engage. Uh, Sheila, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, well, I'd say, first of all, the idea of preparing somebody for an entry-level position is difficult, especially because the animation industry is constantly in flux, so the needs are always changing. And I think if what you're interested in is that entry-level position, I'm not sure it's really worth a four-year degree or a master's degree just for that one entry-level position, because that's something you can really learn online or you know, a more of a trade school environment. Um, so in my opinion, I think it's important to learn how to learn you know, at, at the university level. And I think uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to make your own work. And when you are in the process of expanding yourself educationally in terms of liberal arts and animation and fine arts, et cetera, 
Um, you're learn you will learn all aspects of film production, which will serve you well no matter what area of the industry you end up going in. Because I think everybody in the animation industry is a storyteller, whether you're a character designer or a, st or a storyboard artist. And I think that the idea of learning how to be a storyteller and telling your own stories is going to benefit you in many different ways once you're in the industry environment. So yes, I think we have a responsibility to help our students prepare their portfolios, but that can't be the only thing that is, you know, our purpose is a larger purpose than that. Excellent. Dave, would you like to? Yeah, um, I, I agree with, uh, it's not a, an either or or both end kind of you know, deal. Um, I always built uh, adaptive programs. Um, I'm not an animator, my background isn't in animation, in fact, I was a painting and drawing teacher. All I did was teach kids basic stuff in a high school, a very poor high school. And my, my uh, experience was just these kids loved animation and I knew nothing about it except I liked it. Hmm. And so I adapted to what their needs were. And I was very lucky. We entered a couple of you know, uh, film festivals back then for high school students. And luckily, Chuck Jones, Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnston, and all these people were the judges. <laughs> <laughs> and they liked that my kids weren't uptight, you know, uh, didn't, weren't full of themselves. They bounded up on the stage. They couldn't believe anybody, because most of them were steer, stealing hubcaps off of moving cars. <laughs> and they couldn't believe that these people were giving them awards. And they decided to come out to my classroom, Bill Scott, people like that, and they said, let's go check this guy out, you know and see what's going on. I remember the first time they came out. Um, they came into my classroom and said, uh, we love your enthusiasm and everything that you're doing here. Your kids are just, it's awesome. But you don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what they, that was the first thing. And these, I mean, I was, I could have went one of two ways. I could have either said, I'm crushed and, you know, but well, I said the magic words. I said, would you help me? Mm -hmm. I want these kids to get it. So my whole theory it was based on that. Um, what I decided to do was keep showing them work. It was the smartest damn thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. And I kept showing them work. Anybody who knows me, that's really all I've got to say today, is I fell into an adaptive situation. Every single time we got somebody to come in, I showed them work student work and I furiously took notes I don't know how many of these I got on shelves mm -hmm. where I just put these in the back pocket they're they're uh, they're really for reporters <laughs> now they have iPads but I still use these and I would have them look at our work and tell me not only what the kid needed to do but what I was doing wrong and what I needed to do now think about that that's the whole theory behind what I did so I learned along with my students. So most people who knew me later on thought I was some kind of expert in animation <laughs> and everything else, and I wasn't. I was, I'm really about learning. I'm really about learning theory. So essentially, from that, my students would see what was going on. Later on, I started to read theoretical stuff on this, Love and Wanger stuff on <laughs> peripheral learning and everything, and this stuff works in every field. They don't even talk about animation, but it nails animation. And it's how people learn. I work with Kathy and other people at, at Warner Brothers. That's how most, going way back, uh, most animation was, was learned, is this kind of peripheral learning, mentoring kind of approach. But what I had to do was, I wasn't in a situation where I could get these people all the time. So I had to build up a stable of people. Years later, Tom, uh, Tom Cito, uh, used to come to my class. All these people used to come to my class. I found out years later that Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston and, and uh, Chuck Jones forced them to come to my I thought they wanted to come. We were way the hell out in City of Industry, right? They used to come after work. I thought they liked coming. Um, but they just came because they were told they should come. And um, what happened over the years was we had hundreds of kids into the business at a high school. I had students, uh, Bert Klein came out of my class. He was 17 and got a five-year contract at Disney. I mean, I had kids, it was amazing. And the school adapted. I used to go to the school board. I had school board members whose kids came through my class. 
and they adapted to the program. And I had an easier time than college professors have. We set up what, what's basically called a conservatory, like a music conservatory, where kids could take my class for four years. Can you imagine? So here they're coming in. John Ramirez started in my class when he was 12. Okay, so basically what I'd like to discuss today is it's a simple thing. Sometimes uh, you know, a, a systemic thing can be changed by changing one little thing. I'm a backpacker, I'm a mountain climber. If you go, if my wife and I go one degree off from each other in the morning, we're in a different county at the end of the day. <laughs> so it shows you the power of making a slight change that's critical, that's critical. And so I was saying to myself, what's the one thing I could say today that could make a difference? Because we're all, everybody's faced with this. You're trying to hitch ski. I mean, I think you put it really well. It keeps changing. But the reality is both of those things, having students go for that, that job means like you have to shoot ski. You can't aim where it is now. You've got to find out where it's going. And the only way I was able to do that, we were the first school on the planet to do digital editing. As a result, my son is the digital editor for South Park. And he got a job right out of high school doing digital editing because nobody else knew how to do it. And the whole industry was transitioning. Since when do you get a kid that young getting into the business? And it was because we were constantly working, having them look at our work and tell us where do these kids need to be? Do this, don't do that. We weren't doing it once a year. We weren't doing it at the end of the year. We weren't doing it at the end of their four years. We were doing it every two weeks. Yeah, I think, I think that constant critique, I mean, Dave worked with the acne program and developed this constant critique. Um, but my high school was way better because I had more control over the situation. I mean, that's the one that really, I, I think I got more kids into the business than we did online. Sure. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm interested to hear, uh, Brooke, how, how it's working with you and, uh, and Cartoon Network students coming in, but also as an educator. Yeah, I was thinking about the so. question more as an ed educator. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think my main point of view on this is you have to consider each person as an individual. That's my main thing about it is like some of them, you know, I have students at CalArts who, who want to tell stories and we have to, they have to make a film every year. And I think that that's really valuable. And I think that we hire, I think the industry hires so many CalArts students because they've made those four films and there's so much pressure on them to keep making films and to keep telling stories, even if all of them aren't going to graduate and have their own shows or, you know, be show creators or be directors, at least they can empathize with the whole process because they themselves have done it four times. So if they go and they're a background painter when they leave, that's great. If they're not, if storytelling isn't their strong suit, they still have had to try to do that four times. But so if I have a student who I just kind of can tell, like, they're not, they're not a storyteller, but they do have, you know, maybe great character designs or background design sense. I'll say, well, why don't you make a film that really showcases that talent? And then that will help you find the thing that you want to have later. So, but, you know, there's always going to be people who are just born leaders. There's people who want to be leaders and they want to learn that. So you try to help them along with that. And then there's people who they want to be just part of the process or, you know, not to be <coughs> crass about it, but animation is somewhat of an assembly line and some people want their spot on that assembly line and they don't want to be directors so you can't, like approaching them all like you should all want to be directors doesn't work mm -hmm. but approaching them all like you should just want to have your entry level job and do this one thing you just have to take each person as an individual I'm lucky to teach at a place that we saw pretty small classes that we can do that. Mm. Um, I taught in Detroit for three years. I'm, I'm from the Valley and I moved to Detroit to <laughs> teach for three years and it was like, oh, this is what winter is. <laughs> but, uh, but the students there, the challenge there was that here we are in the middle of the country and there weren't a lot of studios <coughs> there. So them getting internships and building their network of people, that was a hard thing there. But I just, I've tried to help a lot of them since I've been back here with a lot of the same things that I would help my CalArts students with. But I think my takeaway from this question is just look at the individual and see see what they need. I mean, some of them, to me, I, I can look at their portfolios and go, this person really, 
they're really talented. Their stuff really looks like feature film oriented. This person is really influenced by video games. I could see them working in that. This person just looks like they're going to do television. It's just their sensibility. And this person looks like they could do really cool, you know, direct, like commercial directing, like animation, commercial directing. So that's my approach is just to try to take them as much as possible as individuals and help them individually. And I assume you're, you're f getting people at an at a advanced level already, at sort of senior level? Um, as they come into CalArts? Mm -hmm. Or, or, you, or you, are you working with the beginning students or the advanced well, students? Well, it's hard to get, <coughs> bless you, it's, it's really hard to get in now. I think when I went to school there, they took one in four, and I only think we get one in, like, one in ten. They just get mm -hmm. so, it's so much more of a sexy job title, <laughs> animating. I think it was a lot nerdier and under the radar <laughs> when I was there. So they come in with really strong drawing skills. Another advantage of teaching, I think, at a, an arts college as opposed to a university is uh, we don't go by grades. We go strictly by portfolios. So they could have gotten straight Ds in school for all I know, but they can draw like mm -hmm. mad circles around a lot of people. So, but I'm also, I, you know, I love education and got a, a liberal arts degree before I went to CalArts myself. And, you know, I think that it, it's just, again, it's the individual. Do they, is it someone who should be going to a school that has kind of a broader liberal arts mm -hmm. degree, or is it someone who really is just like eats, sleeps, drinks animation, and that's just what they're going to do their whole lives? So. Right. I mean, I think I agree that, you know, working with the individual is really important, but of course you have a curriculum, of, you know, a, a, a curriculum laid out. Yeah. And, you know, it's at that decision, are you, are you deciding, well, get as many skills in there as possible, or is there a track? I mean, I don't know if other people right. have experience with developing curriculum um, that might want to uh, address this, but um, you know, at that point, you have to kind of create either a progression or an array of, of subjects where they, they do have a bunch of choices. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times students go into the program not knowing what area they want to pursue. Exactly. So whether they yeah. want to be a character designer, visual effects artist, CG, or 2D, or whatever. So hopefully they'll learn that in the process of you know, you know, taking mm -hmm. these different classes, but we do have different tracks. So if they want to do visual effects, we do have a set of classes they can take into that end, right. and then 2D and 3D, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but yeah, ho sometimes they'll graduate and then discover the real world isn't sure. what they had expected to, so. Yeah, it's, <laughs> no, no, it is a it's, <laughs> it's, it's a cash no point too, because, you know, the more tracks you develop, I'm in this too, the more tracks you develop, yes, they, if they want to do character design or, or go pre-production, here's the track. But they get like halfway through the track, they're like, yeah, maybe I want to animate, you know? <laughs> right. And it's, and it's, or do you keep it so open that they can just you know, play and explore and try several things, and then maybe by the time they graduate, they just kind of touch the surface. And the biggest complaint we, I hear, and probably a lot of you have heard, is that uh, when students submit portfolios to the industry, they often don't know what they want, and they just mm -hmm. want a storyboard portfolio, or they just want a character. And when we offer yeah. a broader education, they want to show everybody everything, and that's very frustrating from the industry point of view. Yeah. That's a great. That's a great <laughs> point. I mean, you know, and we and, and we every have, studio we wants something different. Yeah. I can <laughs> I can give them advice for Cartoon Network that will not apply. For, like I try to when I do portfolio reviews, tell them you know if you want to work for us, this is not really what we're looking for. But like this morning at portfolio reviews, I sent this girl who was here from France over to the Disney guy. I'm like, go talk to the feature guy. Here's an introduction. It's just yeah. like. Mm -hmm. I there, agree with you. You can't, there's yeah. not one piece of advice to give all of them because all the students want to And I can attest different. to that too because I would often have people from the industry speak to my students mm -hmm. and sometimes they'd say, we definitely want figure drawings and then somebody else would say, no figure <laughs> drawings <laughs> <laughs> at all. Or no yeah. short films. Yeah. Or yes. no short films, games. yes yeah. films. You know, everybody is completely different. Well, so. that, that was the big problem I had too because I had people coming in every two weeks. Yeah. So my right. students would go, right. what the said. hell? I mean, they blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey, I'm not going to hide it from you. So the day you graduate, and then all of a yeah. sudden you turn your stuff in, they got a chance to dialogue. And now I had, I had hundreds of kids, so every year. So it was really difficult, and I had to individualize it. I was the teacher. I was the whole program, okay? And so I had to have all these other people involved because I didn't have a department. I didn't have other folks. So I had these professionals coming in. But the way that that got resolved was the students would start to hook into someone and usually wangle their phone number or whatever it is, and they could keep getting feedback. Yeah. Um, it was really critical. 
um, from me. That was the only way we could do it. And the conservatory approach was the part that allowed me to do what a lot of colleges can't because the colleges have to have someone sign up for a particular class, take it sometimes out of sequence or whatever it is because it's only offered that one time or whatever it is. Because I ran it like a music conservatory, everybody was working on their own individual projects and their own individual portfolios. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole lot of give and take that way that adapted, again, that word, mm -hmm. adapted to what the situation was. You know, it's, you know some schools in, in the LA area have the advantage of bringing in the guest artists. Um, you know, I ran a contest this year with a, a, a school from South Dakota, Bowling Green, and uh, you know Tennessee, and you know they just they don't have the industry to bring people. So and I'm, maybe there's people in here that that have that concern as well. So I have concerns about how many animation programs there are all over the country. <laughs> period. That are so far from. I mean, it used. I. I mean, not to be almost in the olden days, but um, <laughs> but it used to be that if you wanted to study animation, you had to find the few schools. It was like a RISD, an SVA, Sheridan. Cal Arts, UCLA, you know, probably a handful Valley of others. Vermont, Sheridan. Right. Yeah. So, and now just every Tom, Dick, and Harry college has an animation program. And I, you know, when I see portfolios, sometimes I feel like you're not, you're not hearing. Not close. Yeah. It's because how can you teach something when you're so far away? If you want to work, I mean, if you want to make films and you just want to learn the art of animation, which is beautiful and it's wonderful for self expression, I mean, that's where Sheila and I came from, just making very personal films. And that's beautiful, and everyone should get to learn that if they want to. But I feel like there's a little bit of a bait and switch of colleges, mm -hmm. you know, offering something as if they're all going to get jobs in the industry, as if they're just jobs all over the place. And CTN is full of unemployed students. Mm -hmm. And we try to hire, I mean, all the studios, we're all here, and we will try to hire as many people as we can. But... I do feel like there's a glut of programs right now. Is well, that part of I, the issue? That well, well, I, I, I hate to ask, but is it is it all about the jobs? I mean, are, is, are we responsible for yeah. educating <laughs> students to get jobs? Well, so I think there's a couple of things that I want to say about this. Is first of all, it's national average in all design and art and media programs that 50 percent of the people who take those majors don't end up working in that field. So we're going to have students who aren't going to go into the field. So what are we teaching them? We're teaching them project development skills. Mm -hmm. We're teaching them expression. We're teaching them a lot of really useful things. And it's hard for me to have a student in my program who I know, and, and my program's around the corner here in Burbank, so you pretty much bet every student who's in my program is trying to get a job at the studios. Mm -hmm. And there are some I know aren't going there or they're gonna go there as production management, they're not gonna go there as artists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's um, I have to believe I'm teaching them something valuable. I, I think from the first to last job, it's sort of like, it reminds me of this discussion in CG, are you raising generalists or are you raising people who do a particular skill? Right. Well, the, I think the first two years you have to raise generalists. So my students do some of every part of the pipeline. They do stop motion Maya and traditional and 2D CG. And they do a little bit of everything. And then I jump to projects and they do projects. Uh, so my classes have names like senior studio. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't want anybody in my uh, you know, upper level at the school telling me what has to be in that class. And my learning outcomes say things like collaboration and you know, they almost don't say art terms. Mm -hmm. um, it allows the class to evolve yeah, as well. It right. does, and the project is there, and it allows the student to find a voice, to find a home in the pipeline, to find an idea of who they are. Mm -hmm. So that when we talk about the portfolio in the senior year, they actually speak enough of the language to talk about making a niche portfolio and changing it for every studio you go to. and. They don't have that language when they come in, mm. and they need to be generalists at that point. Mm. They need to do everything. So it, to, to me, you can't, you, you can't take a curriculum. It's almost like I look like I'm teaching for entry-level jobs the first two years, and then all of a sudden they're all directors for two years. Mm. Mm. Um, but I think that's an important crossover over the piece mm -hmm. in order you know, because nobody w wants to, uh, you know, I, 
Yeah, it's kind of funny. The title of the show is something that Dan McLaughlin always used to say. If there are any other UCLA people in the room, you know, uh, we teach for your last job was what he always said. And, and then we would get out of there as students with these highly experimental films that you couldn't even put in your portfolio. Nobody wanted to see them. And we'd be really frustrated and go back and say, Dan, what are you doing? You know. And so I've always tried to walk this edge between first job and last job. You know, I completely agree with you. And I think I would add to that list of skills time management as well. You know, oh, yeah. You can finish a film, which is Big not time. an easy thing to do. You know, mm -hmm. that you can apply to any job that you pursue as well. And then, you know, in the industry, you hear people say, oh, I wish I would have done a film in college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that mm -hmm. one time when mm -hmm. you could have the, your, mm -hmm. your own artistic expression. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is, is, is there value? Is there value in keeping that going? Well, I mean, one element to think is, is inter first of all, it's an interesting historical, we may be in part living in the past, the time when you had only X number of schools and, most, and only some people wanted to be in animation, therefore, the likelihood that anybody with even half talent was gonna get a job is over, and we have to accept the world has changed dramatically. And what you do have is a situation where there are many, many, many schools and many, many more people who want to be in those schools and, and still only so many places mm -hmm. that they can go once they come out. One thing that strikes me is that we need different kinds of schools, and the idea that there, there isn't one model. I mean, I, one of my biggest laughs this year was finding out that Seth MacFarlane studied at RISD. I thought, I could just imagine this guy in the middle of that program and what it was like for him, but that, you know, evolving different models of schools that serve different needs, different students, different, you know, the kid who has already been through the fine arts program and now knows they want a job and wants to spend a year or two, as little time as possible, getting a very defined skill is different from the kid coming in at a high school who doesn't yet, who has some kind of general talent but doesn't yet know what it is. Um, the kid who, I mean, I always found that teaching, you know, being the, usually the filmmaking teacher, the value for many of the students, because they were motivated by their own ideas, the learning curve was tremendous. But it isn't, and so for, and for some people that was the best vehicle, but not necessarily for everybody. Mm -hmm. And yes, even the getting into third year was at the time was, you know, the step out the, the, before you stepped out the door. So two things strike me. One is that, well, three. No, five, no, six, and John. <laughs> um, uh, one is that, that we should be not, there isn't one model. The studios all want, each studio wants you to make the school that's for them. I've had that conversation. The studios, and part of it is the studios, they need to realize what can and can't be done. But they still, they used to do their own training. Yeah. Some of them still do, but not all. They still need to do the, the final tweaking is really their job. It can't yeah. be the schools, and that's, that's something the schools have. We're to, doing, just uh, yeah. note, we're getting more people lately from comic books and sequential right. art oh, backgrounds because we don't animate in house. Yes, right. So, if, and we have storyboard driven shows, right. which means that our storyboard artists also have to bring the funny to the table. Right. Yes. And we often find people from comic book backgrounds, so we'll help them with the film yeah. language. Right. If they can, if they can write and draw yep. and be funny. We can help them. So that's that's where we're stepping that, up this, with education. Right, and that's and that's the model. I think all the students have to realize that they're not going to get this perfect dropping off the no. ceiling for your studio. It cannot be no. impossible. But that so but so but develop the recognition you need different models and to encourage different models. So there's a selection and depending on what you need, you will hopefully then find it. Uh, another one is given how many schools is is what is the movement been as there say has been in universities and various things for as educators and industry to say, it's time to start setting some standards so that students know this school here is a two-bit school, they don't know what they're talking about, right. and they will take all of your money now, because it's because it's so sexy. Oh, the school I And deliver nothing. They so, would, where, so the beginning of- If you uh, had a pulse, they yeah. would let you in. No, yeah. there was, no. if you had a pulse and a checkbook. Terra, it's Terra, it's, 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 it's mostly and, and, and you know, and you know, you know, having been at Sheridan when, you know, just kind of coming in at the end of the big hiring period, but when but there was still a lot of carry on, in people's minds that every job was going to be this brilliant job for anybody who, who passed through the school. Mm -hmm. Parents don't know. They only know what they read in the media. Right. So, so finding some means to help them have a possibility mm -hmm. of making a good choice. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if it does exist. Maybe I, I'm not aware. If it doesn't, it's certainly time well, for it's interesting. The Educators Forum at one point that was one of our projects wanting to find out specifically what each school does and get at least have a list mm -hmm. so we know like what is your focus at, the, at each school yeah but then it's also okay to set standards it's okay to start saying look at the, the people who've been around the longest day, especially people say you're in position both foot in actually in hiring yeah. and in educating to start to say what's what's a good school look like could, cool. could i just jump in on that you know the studios do that most people i worked for warner brothers yeah. i was the head of artist development 
and every single studio has their own FBI and CIA and their own files, and they know that. Yeah. I mean, they keep a record of every single thing that comes in. Actually, every portfolio that comes in, they rate it and they file it. Yep. And when they look for those students, so maybe they don't have a match at that point, but then they, right. all the ones that got a top grade, even though they didn't need them then, they'll call those people later, have them bring in their work. Right. They are really on it. And the studios have been around the longest, know where this sure. talent's coming from. Right. They've yeah. done that already, but they can't release that, that, that uh, yes. to the public because... Well, of course. You know. But that's, but, so I'm talking, I, I'm not, of course, I know some people with talents go to, but they're, but the most those the tin pot schools don't necessarily know that they're a tin pot without trying to be offensive but often but for profit schools know that they're but for profit, profit so so you know so, <laughs> so, so it's really more in terms know. of really for the person entering the school for the student the parent right. so that they know what education they're getting yeah that it's because then you're going to get fewer because then you get this poor person comes out who is clueless and then it's a problem for everybody really because there's lots of them now so oh, it's yeah. just a small number so that's one thing to start thinking about it's, in other words, it's not the studio stance, it's, a, it's an educator's stance. Say, well, right. it's but it has to match with what the, well, what the students in, in, in relation, yeah. to, no, it has to be done in relate. that's the whole thing. It's, it's, it's the educators in relationship to the employers coming together to put something, but it's for the students and parents, people choosing the schools, and also to then encourage schools that are getting away with something, because no one's looking. Sometimes, but, but, you, sometimes but again, you can watch those. Can I post this? Uh, sure, I'll, 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 I'm just throwing this out yeah, 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 no, I think it's, yeah. look, I ran a conservatory at yeah. and I don't know any other person was allowed to yeah. do that. Yeah, you had this wonderful so, position. Yeah, the, the, but, and it just evolved. But yeah. the thing is, I think that should be under consideration because, much, yes. uh, let me tell you, um, animation is much more like developing musical talent than yeah. it is like physics or yeah. any of these other things. Yeah, it's not a rocket the, it's not That's a step right. Step. And, exactly. and yeah. the, you know, I, I think you raise really good points. I, But I, I think we can do that as teachers. Yeah. And not that I'm doing it anymore. I'm doing more backpacking than I am teaching. <laughs> um, but the, 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 reality, the, the, the reality is we can do that ourselves. I mean, yeah. we used to go to Sheridan and everything else, and Sheridan had studios up there in Toronto yes, and everything yep. else mm -hmm. we had to compete with mm -hmm. uh, along with the other studios. And you guys were free with it. If we came up there, that's how I met Aubrey. I met Aubrey when he was a student. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Yeah. So the thing is, um, as, you know, essentially, Show the work, yes. and you know mm -hmm. the thing is, you can bet your life mm -hmm. that you're, if you're getting people into studios, you're seen as one of their places oh, they're going to hit all oh, the time. Oh, absolutely. And the other schools yeah. aren't. Yeah. Okay, it's just that simple. Yeah. Um, but by just showing the work all the time, mm -hmm. essentially you're mm -hmm. going to, and and I tell students this: if yeah. your teachers aren't doing it, if mm -hmm. they're not, yeah. you do it. Yeah. You make sure you go to conferences, you make sure mm -hmm. that you, any chance you get to show work, if you know anybody in the business, could you get someone mm -hmm. to look at my work and give me feedback? If if your instructors or your school isn't doing it, you should be doing it. You need to be a steward of your own future. Because if you're not getting that kind of feedback along the way, again, I'll use a backpacking metaphor. If I go off in the morning, mm -hmm. and I'm off of just to walk a mile, I could be you know, and I have to make a course correction. Now I gotta come all the way to hell back and then I've gotta get back on the trail. Mm -hmm. By having people look at your work all the time. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you get a GPS. <laughs> and what's the GPS every yeah. two weeks? And then people go, Yeah, but it's only a couple of kids. The kids used to call it good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. I give them no joke. I'll give you the you know, people say, How did you get so many people hired? I'm gonna give it to you. People would come in, I'd give them five portfolios I thought were my best students. Because every teacher has an ego, and they want to show, hey, we're doing it, okay? These are really good, okay? So you're not gonna get around that. Every teacher has that, I did too. Then my students who would disagree with me about that guy, he doesn't know who's really good. They'd vote for five. They'd pick five people up, master, show them these. And then I tell them, pick out five kids randomly. You couldn't come into one of those reviews unless you had your reel and your portfolio. And they'd pick you. Okay? Random. They called the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay? <laughs> that was their term. Now, what did that do? The first five that I picked, I was being graded as a teacher. <laughs> am, I, am I picking out the work mm -hmm. that, they, you know, that I think is good? And a lot of times they say, Master, why the hell did we look at that? You thought that was good? I was learning. She might come out to my class and tell me this, but then I'm listening. 
okay? And then the kids would hear it too. They would go, whoa, we thought this was really great. Yeah. And they thought it wasn't, okay? And one last thing too is I didn't um, force my kids to get, I was in a trade school. I mean, uh, we got a moniker of that because we got hundreds of kids in the yeah, business. Yeah, but the thing is, none of the, like, CalArts isn't a trade That's school. right. Well, we copied but, but you. animation, mm -hmm. because it's always been a commercial thing in the United States. We don't have a right. national film board. It's always been seen, like, we don't talk about English students. For If we were all English teachers, we wouldn't say, what what should we be training our kids for, for jobs? <laughs> it's like, you're just going to learn about literature. It's, right. It's always this conversation about animation, because it always borders on this kind of vocational thought when when you're going to university to learn it's animation, the student maybe. choice isn't it, it isn't is. it in the end the student choice I had Jan Svonfeyer came to my class and I had kids who got into independent filmmaking and everything but it was their choice I wasn't going to force them one way or the other but I was going to say also I, I think other educators are finding this problem as well that mm -hmm. because the economy is so compressed people are so worried about getting jobs mm -hmm. we're getting a pushback from students thinking well we're not getting this skill mm -hmm. we're not getting that right. skill we, and right. usually it's a software program right. you know which you can learn online you don't really need to pay the big bucks to yeah. get a graduate degree to learn a software program but, but then we get this pushback and they, they're demanding to, to get these specific skills that they think are the important ones to get that job and they're not seeing the bigger picture and hopefully right. what we're providing for them. And another thing that I often tell students too is, you know, they you know, they're looking at the industry to see what who's hiring. So I want to make that show real because that's who's hiring now. Right. Often it'll be a CG portfolio. So they're trying to mold themselves into making that CG portfolio that looks like a thousand others and right. probably not as good because that's not where their heart is. Right. So I always say if you follow what you really love to do, you are going to excel and you're going to stand above everyone else because that's where your passion is and that's what you're good at. And it's just so hard to compete with everyone else that's doing it just as a job. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ken yeah. Ward, was, he's the creator of Adventure Time. He was one of my high school students at CSA. Hmm. And I don't say my, like I take any credit for him. He just, he always had his style, and it wasn't a popular style because Adventure Time wasn't made yet. It's just the way he drew, <laughs> and he didn't really follow instructions a lot, and he just kept doing what he wanted to do. He wasn't trying to, you know, at that time it was more like, I'm going to copy what Disney's doing. Like, that would have been the more popular thing for him to do to try to copy. Well, thank goodness no one stepped in and said, you can't do that, because he just kept doing his thing, and now, you know, now he's got a show, but now in portfolios I'll see people copying that and they yeah. probably have that when you do portfolio reviews for right. schools so and I agree it's really too. important to do your Evolve. your own thing and because you know I have been teaching for more than 20 years now because I taught in Philadelphia and then mm -hmm. I taught at community college and now USC and I have to say the students who have been most successful who have their own series you mm -hmm. know or who are working in feature films those are the ones that always follow their own vision yep. and in fact we recently had a student hired at Pixar not for CG work but for his stop motion work mm -hmm. which was really interesting it's a good lesson for future students yeah and how do you how do you nurture that how do you nurture sort of the creators the, the that's people always that been our own. philosophy which is why we're not the trade school where it looked as more experimental right. mm -hmm. so and students sometimes it's are like the by Jules that. Engel thing it's not it's what I don't take away from the students it's not what I give them it's what I don't take away I don't we were taught not to box them into something else but USC is straddling that a little bit more than CalArts yeah because uh, partly I think because of this pushback as well and we're really trying to provide that but there's yeah. that fear of yeah. pushing them in a direction that may not be the best direction for them so mm -hmm. it's a challenge as an educator mm -hmm. it is a challenge pa part of what I think we're up against I think did partly start in the 90s I was at Sheridan when the program was first starting years ago there was no media there was no in fact you had to explain <coughs> what animation was to it anybody outside mm -hmm. and you know so you know Sheridan was rolling along for years and years but what was interesting it was a pioneering phase even the way the program came into being there was no industry to support it right the industry was created because the program was created in, differently in Canada I'm sure the same thing was happening with Cal you know the, the role of schools in other words the inventiveness of the school to take a chance on something that doesn't exist yet which was you know picking up a couple of a few of you have said like that far ahead of the curve mm -hmm. Once that big explosion happened in the 90s and everybody was hiring, certainly, you know, it was in the papers constantly, constantly it became a thing. Yeah, and covered said, Time Magazine. Everything. And I think that Hottest planted something in the minds of, of parents and eventually the kids and whatever that yeah. we're still living with, even though it has nothing to do with anything. There were a lot of jobs back then. Because there, there were a lot of jobs. Suddenly, it, it was it, it, it basically we dealt with a gold <laughs> rush situation. Yeah. Which is long over. But as I say, there's, a, there's a problem now in the minds of the general public that still hangs on to that, and that is part of where that push feeling of, well, you're supposed to get this great job after, afterwards, which then muddies the whole water of why you're there in the first place. So it's almost like we have to 
backtrack around that or move forward around it to say, look, if that was a moment in time, it's all it was, yeah. and if you're coming in, you actually still need a huge passion for it, a real devotion. It's not this easy job that most people should not be there. As we know, it takes a, a very specific number of skills. It's an amazing number, but you have to have those set in order to have it even a half a chance of surviving. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's part of that responsibility to recognize that is part of where the problem that we're dealing with right now came from. It was mm -hmm. media created. Oh. We have we have yeah. roughly five or so minutes left, and I, and I do want to hear if there's other people yeah. that are dying to have the voice <coughs> heard around the room. Are there other other comments or questions that people have for the group? Is it enough to just allow students to find their voice? Like, I find I take so much responsibility for students at time, and then I bring that home, and it crushes me when you know little Sally didn't get a job at right. know, a TV show. Or little Sally. So. I, just, I find that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, the question is to ask little Sally in in five years how she feels. Yeah, you know? and it's like it's yeah. like they they just I just kind of feel now if I just give them the opportunity to find a way of thinking, whether that's yeah. for just to do you know rotoscoping on an effects film or whether it's creating the next Cartoon Network hit, there's a way of thinking to get you in that way. So is that enough for us as? And you have to think of things like what a teacher might say to someone. I mean, if you think about the guys who created South Park, I don't know that their animation, <laughs> if they even took animation classes, would say, oh, this, you know, you guys are amazing. You're going to make it. I mean, you, there's always, I never, I try not to. I don't think I do quash any dreams because I never, like, I don't know. Maybe you're the one. Maybe what you're saying doesn't, you know, speak to my sensibility, but maybe that's going to take off somewhere. I mean, the great thing now is we have, you know, there's so many places to just put your work up and get your followers. It's super democratic. Mm. I mean, we find people from all over the world just through mm. Tumblr, just mm. like, hey, do you want freelance on this show? It just, they may not have even gone to college. It's mm. just, we just love their work and we think that their sensibility will fit whatever thing we've got right now. So, I, I was there's nothing just stopping at them from putting work up. As the students, what they wanted. I mean, I had to, you know, to address that. Um, I, I agree with you, um, but I always made it the student choice. See, I got gray hair early too because I worried about all these kids, and I had so many of them. But and people used to say, "You got a hundred in this year. What are your problem?" I said, "I had two hundred that didn't get in. I, those are the ones I worry about. The hundred take care of themselves." Yeah. The, the 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 thing about what I'm saying again, I'll repeat it again, is getting that feedback is I had my kids, I had Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnson, Chuck Jones, all these people. Of course, they were heavyweights, right? But I had Simpsons come out first, mm -hmm. right? When they started. Okay. Well, and Tracy Ullman. And, yeah. oh, and I mean, and then all of a sudden, I wasn't looking at that. I didn't even think it would last. But the <laughs> students and those people dialoguing, I, had I have kids there now directors. Mm -hmm. And been directors there for years. It... Because I did this adaptive system, I call it the who says, okay? It's an adaptive system. It allowed for that. See, it broke that in. It, it, you know, the whole thing about building a nonlinear mechanical system versus an adaptive biologic system, okay, think about that, is that's why you see old rusted fence posts out in, in the wild and you see ivy growing all over them and they're alive. And then eventually the rusted stuff goes. If you have an adaptive system, you're gonna be able to deal with that. So if you're getting them to see these things, mm -hmm. um, they're gonna make those choices, and then again, it's off you. See, the, the problem is <laughs> when you set up a mechanical system that's either one way or another, mm -hmm. either or, instead of both and, what happens is then it is your responsibility because you're gonna take the heat when you tell a kid, you should do this, you should do that, and then it doesn't work. Mine was putting them in touch with the people who are there. It's their responsibility. I'll do everything I can to help you get to your goal. But it's not my responsibility except to work with you to get there. Okay? But I can't assure it. I used to tell the kids, I don't write the checks. My grade book isn't what they look at to hire you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, all my students, they could tell you I said that all the time to them. I said, but I will do, and my students will tell you, I did anything I could for them. You could talk to any of my students through the years. I would go, but it was their responsibility. Well, on, and to, to add to that, I would say, you know, I, I also sometimes speak with people who are looking at our program, and they say, well, do I need this undergraduate degree to get this job? And I said, you don't need a high school degree yeah. to get this job. You don't, need, job. Any you don't need this degree for that. And that's why you're coming here. You shouldn't be coming here, yeah. honestly. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a really great point is to set up realistic expectations mm -hmm. from both the students mm -hmm. and necessarily their parents. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, again, that saves everybody down the line because somebody doesn't come back to you afterwards and say, well, you were supposed to, you know, quit pro quo, you got the degree, where's the job? Mm -hmm. And you have to explain, well, you know, the job may not come for a year, for two years, for a few years, and you're, you know, it's this continuing journey. It's, and I, for me personally, having been involved in education and animation again for like 20 years, I don't remember going to school, it was a different time, and thinking that I needed to get this to get this particular job. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the focus. And I feel like so much now that that's that become the laser focus mm -hmm. of a lot of people coming into this. And you have to upfront say to them, look, yes, you can make a very comfortable living doing this, but it's not something you should do. If you want a steady check, become a plumber, you know, or a, a mortician or something, you know, that, you know that's, that's gonna be there. Right? Because the animation job is gonna be there for that particular project, and then you're gonna have to get on your horse and find the next project. That's not, you know. People are always dying. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> we don't know if we're going to make another feature. And I have said, if you are here specifically, I, I said, I cannot promise you that you will get a job when you graduate, and I would be suspicious of any program that will promise you a job when you graduate. Totally. Yeah, yeah no, no program should be promising. It is 3.15, um, so we have to start wrapping up. Um, but um, guys, continue this discussion, please, amongst yourselves. Uh, there's a lot of educators here. I yeah. think uh, this is fantastic. Um, so out, out, out of this room, let's continue this um, and join the uh, Animation Educators Forum and get on our web list and uh, post ideas and for new, new topics and new, new conferences. Uh, I want to thank our guests for being here and the Animation Educators Forum and all you guys for teaching awesome students all the time. Clapping.